Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. The wife made the fatal mistake of not noticing the cart that filmed everything as she. Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. Computers are wonderful tools. They make life easier and more difficult at the same time. This is one of life's little ironies that I have had to come to terms with. On the one hand, computers make it easier for me to keep track of bills, payroll, invoicing, client contact information, and a whole host of things I need to do to keep my business thriving. Using computers helps me reduce costs because I don't need as many people in the office. On the other hand, when these computers break down or when some important file gets corrupted, things get complicated. In the seven years that I have been running my family's landscaping business, there have been several instances of computer failure. Of course, I have learned to minimize these risks. I have local and cloud backups of important data, and I also have some redundancy in the critical infrastructure so that if there is a failure, the impact on operations is minimal. Oops, I got so deep into technical details that I forgot to introduce myself. I am Donald Summers, Don to my friends and Donnie to my wife and mother, and only to them. I am 35 years old. I'm 6 feet 5 inches, and 22 years of working outdoors have left me with what my wife calls a warm look. I also have a deep, semi-permanent tan. I have been married to the love of my life, Brittany Summers, for the past 13 years. Brittany works as a personal trainer at a local gym. She is also 35 years old, and unlike me, she has fair skin. She is blonde with blue eyes and a light touch of freckles on the bridge of her nose. Britt is 5 feet 2 inches, very petite and athletic. With her fair skin, light freckles, and charming smile, Brittany looks like a little fairy. We have two children, our 9-year-old daughter, Danielle, and our 7-year-old son, Brian. The business, Summers Landscaping, was founded by my father. As a child, I helped my father in the office. My mother had a very difficult pregnancy with me, so they decided not to have any more children. As a result, I was very close to both of them, spending as much time with them as I could. I never doubted that one day, when my father was ready to retire, I would take over the business. As I got older, my father insisted that I work in the fields with the crews. He said it would teach me how a business really works better than working in an office. To my surprise, I discovered that I absolutely loved it. I was never afraid of physical labor, and I took to it like a duck to water. By the time I was in high school, I was managing work crews during the summer. When I finally took over the business seven years ago, I expanded my client base and services. Now we have 12 different work teams and a huge list of landscaping, ornamental gardening, and snow removal services. With the increase in the number of work crews, my need to go out into the field has decreased, except during peak times. However, I still go out because I love it, plus it's helpful for the crews when the boss comes out and checks their work. However, more and more often, I find myself in a small office attached to a company warehouse, dealing with the mountain of documents that any growing business generates. The end of March and beginning of April is when I spend the most time in the office. I do tax work, check employee files, review contracts, etc. For about two weeks, I don't leave the office at all during work hours. It's been that way almost since I took over. This particular year, my mother was with me. She helped her father do the bookkeeping when he ran the business himself, but my dad didn't use computers and my mom wasn't the most tech-savvy person in the world. She accidentally erased some very important files. Luckily, my backups are fine, however, restoring such a volume of data from backup storage takes time. Since I had a few minutes to spare while I waited for the files to be restored, I open Google Earth. I've been using this tool a lot lately when planning a project. It helps to have a bird's eye view of the site before you start working with excavators and trenchers. This way, I don't have to spend money on expensive aerial photography until it's time to impress the client at the final presentation. I spent a few minutes on this project, but in the end, I decided that I had done all I could without the client's input. My backups weren't fully loaded yet, so I decided to take a look at my house. I've been wanting to build a pool for a long time, and now that the kids are older, I thought it might be time to seriously consider the idea. That's when everything started to go to hell. When I clicked and enlarged the image of my house, I noticed something strange, 
there was a car in her driveway that I didn't recognize. I try to be as involved as possible in my family's life and know almost all of Brittany's friends. However, at first, I didn't think much of it. The photos seemed to capture the winter season that had just passed. There was a light, patchy layer of snow on the house and lawn. Looking at the garage, I saw that the addition to it had been completed, which meant the photo couldn't be more than four months old. The car, unknown to me, was red, but that's all I could discern. I don't know much about cars and wouldn't recognize the make and model anyway. I looked at the file transfer progress bar and saw that it had barely moved. Well, at least I had something to do while I waited, I thought to myself. I returned to Google Earth and looked at the satellite image of my house for a few more minutes. The angle of the sun gave no clue as to the time of day. Ha, huh, I said, not fully aware that I had made the sound. Then I clicked on the Street View tab. I knew in advance that this probably wouldn't help, it is very unlikely that the Street View image was taken on the same day and time as the satellite image above. However, I had time and was curious, so I made that fateful little mouse click. The Street View image was taken later. It was sunny, and the dogwood tree I had planted in our front yard was just beginning to bloom. The car that caught my attention wasn't visible, but my wife, Brittany, was. She was very visible, standing in the front door of our house with a man who was not me, hugging her and kissing her. One of her hands was visible too, squeezing one of his buttocks. My temper immediately boiled over. My wife is my wife, and she kissed and touched another man. I forced myself to calm down before doing anything else. I printed out several copies of the image. I wanted to have a paper copy. Then I took a closer look at the man in the photograph. The camera angle didn't give me a good view of his face, but he looked vaguely familiar. With great effort, I suppressed my anger. It will have its time, but first, I had to figure out what exactly was going on. What was happening in this photo was clearly unacceptable, and no matter what else might have happened, we had to talk about it. As painful and unbearable as it was, I had to find out what else was going on. But how? I've read a lot of the same stories you probably have, where the husband installs cameras throughout the house. Sometimes he installs simple recording devices, sometimes he hires a private detective. These were all options, of course. I'm tech savvy enough to install cameras, this is not quantum physics. Installation of recording devices is also easy. Hiring a private investigator is also an option, although the cost can be high. In addition, in my work, I do not have fixed working hours. If I wanted to keep an eye on her or do surprise house checks, I could do it with minimal impact on the business. I also needed to think about the end goal. Wait, I thought, shaking my head. Before there is an end goal, I need to know what's really going on. Let's figure this out first and then we'll think about what to do about it. I growled slowly as I looked at the photo again. No matter how hard I tried, I could not completely suppress my anger. Then a thought occurred to me. It might be a long shot, but maybe this will be a start. The man in the photo resembled Brittany's old college boyfriend. It took me a few minutes, but I finally remembered the guy's name, Benjamin Clausen. Yes, that was it. He was a big football hero at the university, leading the school to its first regional championship in decades. Completely forgetting about file recovery, I opened the browser and started searching. You know, I think the average person would be completely shocked and maybe a little scared by what can be found with a simple Google search. In just 30 minutes, I had photos, biographical information, and job details that were publicly available. I was amazed at how easy it was. The thought flashed through my mind as to how private detectives remain in business under such conditions, but then I plunged into studying the issue. By all accounts, Mr. B. Clausen made a name for himself in the real estate world after graduating from college. He certainly tried to make it to the NFL, but a knee injury ruled that out. He first moved to Denver, Colorado, and then, about two years ago, he moved back to our small hometown and opened his own agency. Based on information available in the public domain, he must be doing a pretty good job selling real estate. I'll admit he definitely had the looks to be a good salesman. He also managed to get married and have his own child. His son was a sweet little guy, I thought. His wife was cute but couldn't compare to Brittany, at least not in my opinion. 
Her name was Angela Clausen, and she was 37 years old. In a photo I found online, she had soft, curly honey brown hair, her eyes were a nice shade of green, and she had cute dimples when she smiled. She was fuller than Brittany but not fat. Mrs. Clausen was an accountant and apparently worked for her husband's real estate agency. This, I thought with disgust, is the perfect scheme. As a realtor, he would be out of the office all the time, but he would always know where she was. This would make it easier to find time for extramarital affairs, and besides, the chance that she would catch him in the act was minimal. Then, an insidious idea occurred to me. I looked at my watch, 10.33 a.m. I found Benny's real estate number in a local online directory and made a call. Good morning, you've called Clausen Real Estate, your local partner for all real estate matters. How can I direct your call? A pleasant female voice answered. Good morning. Please connect me to Mr. Ben Clausen, I requested. I'm very sorry, the voice replied. Mr. B. Clausen is currently showing a property. I expect him to return in an hour to an hour and a half, maximum. Would you like to leave your contact information, and I will ask him to call you back? No thanks, I replied. I guess I'll just try calling later. Goodbye. I pressed the end call button and put the phone in my vest pocket. I tried to think it over. I didn't know for sure if there was an affair going on between this guy and my wife, but it was clear that Brittany was doing something inappropriate with another man. The man in the Google Earth photo looked a lot like Ben Clausen, and the fact that he was her ex-boyfriend was highly suspicious. I was overcome by an irresistible desire to act. It may not have been the best idea I've ever had, but I decided to take the initiative into my own hands. I grabbed a copy of the printed photo and headed to my truck, locking the office behind me. I jumped in and started the engine, but when I turned to check for cars behind me before pulling out of the driveway, I saw a toy car on the cab bench. My son must have left it the last time he rode with me. Despite my anger, I stopped. No matter what happened, my actions would affect more than just me and Brittany. There were two more precious, innocent lives to take care of, lives that, as a loving father, I was obligated to protect. Anger battled with my mind for several agonizing minutes before I finally released the brakes and pulled out onto the street. I went to the address listed on Benny's website. The office was on the fifth floor of a new office building that had recently opened as part of a project to revitalize the city center. It's not like there's much to liven up in our downtown, I thought to myself as I parked nearby. I waved to the foreman of one of my work crews as I walked toward the main entrance. It was ironic that my company was awarded the contract to improve the area around this building, I thought. I noticed the surprise on the foreman's face when I entered the building instead of going up to talk to him, but I was on a mission at the moment. I had a completely different task in mind. I got a few strange looks as I walked through the atrium to the elevators, but I was used to it. Even without my outfit standing out among all the business suits and skirts, my size always attracts attention. This never leaves the pale-faced occupants of offices like this one unnoticed. After a few seconds of waiting in the elevator, I found myself on the fifth floor. Soon, I walked through the doors of the Clausen Real Estate Agency. Mrs. Angela Clausen was sitting at the office desk. Her photos were either outdated or taken by someone who didn't care about showing her in the best light. She was still easy to recognize with the same hair, slightly rounded face, and cute smile with dimples, but she was definitely slimmer than I had thought from the photo. She was dressed in a professional business suit. She stood up to greet me, and I noticed that she was wearing a mid-thigh length pleated skirt instead of the pants I was expecting. I also noticed that she was significantly taller than Brittany. As she approached me, I saw that the top of her head reached my chin, not my chest. Hello, she said kindly, extending her hand. I'm Angela. How can I help you today? I returned her handshake, noting that she had a strong, professional grip and didn't hesitate to make eye contact. Clearly, this was a professional businesswoman well accustomed to meeting potential clients. My first impressions were favorable. Perhaps we could help each other. Hello, I'm Donald Summers, I said. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Clausen. Nice to meet you, Mr. Summers. How can I help you? Mrs. Clausen asked formally. I have a photograph that I would like you to look at and then answer a few questions, I began. 
I picked up the manila envelope in which I had placed the photo. Angela's eyes narrowed as she caught my tone and expression. I assume you're not here to talk about buying a house, she said dryly. It wasn't a question, but I still shook my head. No, I replied. She thought for a while, then her face again acquired a professional, business-like expression. Please follow me, she said simply. She led me to a door at the back of the room. As she passed through, she stopped to look into the next room. Chris, can you watch the front desk, please? Of course, Angie, a deep voice said from the room. Without another word, she led me into what was supposed to be the break room and closed the door. She sat calmly at the table and motioned for me to join her. Her facial expression indicated she was waiting for me to get down to business. I opened the envelope, pulled out a photograph, and handed it to her. The woman in this photo is my wife, Brittany, I said. I know she dated Ben Clausen in college. I want to know your opinion. Do you think this man is your husband? Angela picked up the photo as if it were a dirty diaper, reluctantly but with an appearance that it had to be done. She looked at it for several minutes, her expression changing from curiosity to a kind of sad melancholy and then to anger. After about five or six minutes, she returned the photo to me. Yes, she said. I'm almost sure. When was this taken? I don't know for sure, I replied. I found it on Google Earth Street View. They're standing on the threshold of my house, but it can't be older than three months. How do you know this? She asked. I pointed to Brittany's ear. I gave her these earrings for Christmas, I said simply. Her eyes met mine, and I noticed the hint of sympathy in them. Then she looked out the window for several minutes. Finally, she turned to me again. I'm as sure as I can be that it's my husband in the photo, she said heavily. I recognize the clothes and his face, and the fact that they've met before is highly suspicious. Have you talked to your wife about this? She asked. No, I just found it this morning, I said. Besides, according to her schedule, she should be at work right now. But she's not at work? Angela asked. I stared at her for a moment and then sighed. I quietly pulled out my phone and dialed Brittany's number. I didn't expect her to answer during business hours, and she didn't. Then I called the gym. I recognized the voice of the person who answered. It was Mandy Thomas, another coach and our friend. Hello, Don, she said happily, recognizing my voice. What's wrong? Hi, Mandy, I said. Look, I really need to talk to Britt. Can you call her, please? There was silence in response. Mandy was so quiet that I could hear the fast music from the gym, as well as the sound of weights and machines. Mandy, are you still there? I asked. Ah, uh, yes, Don, her voice trailed off. What? Did she tell me where she was meeting me? I asked. Ah, uh, yeah, she said something about Logan's, Mandy replied nervously. Thanks, Mandy, I said and hung up. What did she say? Angela asked. Wait a second, I replied. I opened the Find My Phone app. Brit and I had it because Brittany kept losing hers. I'd offered her a phone case with a belt clip, but she always refused. It only took a few seconds for the app to show the location icon. It was at our house, more precisely, her phone was at our house. That didn't necessarily mean Brittany herself was there, but she had the phone in her hand when she left in the morning so I knew she couldn't have forgotten it at home. I put the phone away and told Angela what Mandy had said and what I had just discovered. I watched as her expression became even more angry. Before I knew it, she was already on her feet, heading toward the front door of the office. I had to work hard to keep up with her. Chris, she said, I'm going to lunch. If Mr. Clausen returns before me, call me immediately. Understood, Chris replied the surprise evident in his voice. Angela looked at me as we entered the elevator, her eyes blazing with anger. You better drive, she said furiously, pressing the button for the first floor. There must be a very good reason for this photo. I already forgave him once. Has he cheated on you before? I asked, surprised. Then I realized that it wasn't worth asking someone I had just met. Sorry, I said. Don't worry she said with a half-smile. Yes, he's done this before, in Colorado. 
In fact, part of the reason we moved here to Indiana was to get a fresh start. I forgave the idiot because of little Robbie. Her eyes softened and lost their sharpness when she mentioned her son, but then they hardened again. But Robbie isn't so little anymore, and I'm not in the mood to forgive today. The first few minutes of the car ride were silent. Finally, Angela's curiosity got the better of her. I'm a little surprised that your wife was brave enough to bring my husband to your home, she said. It's a risk, I replied, but the risk is minimal. She knows that at this time of year, I usually don't leave the office because of all the things that need to be done. I'm a creature of habit, like most people, and she knows me well. Hell, even if I went out, I would call her and tell her. That gives her enough time to get her lover out of the house. My voice was filled with bitterness, and I knew it. I gave Angela an apologetic look to let her know I didn't blame her. I'm so trusting and predictable that she could have been cheating on me for years, and I would never have known. Angela was silent for several minutes as I drove as quickly as possible toward my house. When she spoke, I heard sympathy in her voice again. There are almost always signs when a spouse is cheating, she said quietly. Yes, I know there are, I replied. But I didn't notice any. Our, uh, intimate relationship didn't suddenly stop or anything. She did not behave any differently towards me or the children, at least as far as I could tell. She doesn't have nights out with her friends. Ben didn't show any of the classic signs either, she replied, not before and not recently. I just mentioned it because, well, her voice trailed off as she looked out the window. I shrugged helplessly, concentrating on the traffic. As I turned onto my street, I noticed the red car in the driveway. I was so focused on this discovery that Angela's voice startled me a little. This is Ben's car, she said. There was still a lot of anger in her tone, but there was also an undeniable note of sadness. Well, that was understandable. If I found what I expected to find in my home, it would end my marriage, and I think the same would happen to Angela's. I parked my car on the street in front of my neighbor's house. I glanced at Angela, then walked out and headed to the gate into the yard. Angela followed me silently, though I noticed she had taken a rather expensive-looking digital camera out of her bag. I had an even better one on my desk in the office, but naturally, I hadn't even thought about taking it. Damn it. I quietly opened the gate, and we crept into the yard. A few minutes later, we found ourselves at the back door. I opened it and led us both into the house, quietly closing it behind me. I stopped, listening carefully. I heard my wife's voice, and there was no doubt about what she was doing. Her sounds and quiet cries of pleasure were undeniable. I won't lie, underneath my shell of anger, I felt my heart break when I heard Brittany's voice. I motioned for Angela to follow me. Her expression was a little strange, but I didn't pay attention to her anymore. I was too focused on Brittany's voice. The sound seemed to come from the living room. Sure enough, when I cautiously peered from the kitchen into the living room, there she was, Brittany, lying on the sofa and sound like an easily accessible woman. Wait a second. What woman? Confused, I stopped and looked around. Then I saw Benny. He stood at the opposite wall, filming the action on a tablet and satisfying himself. Next to me, Angela also started filming with her camera. It broke my stupor. I entered the room, and anger began to overwhelm me. I tried to keep it under control, but I felt like I was quickly losing this battle. Angela's hand shot out like lightning and grabbed my arm. I turned to her, irritated by the interruption, but she shook her head and tried to pull me back. Well, I thought, the damage to my marriage has already been done and documented. I think I can wait another second or two before I start breaking things. I retreated reluctantly, feeling my stomach churn at what I was seeing. After a few moments of watching the strange blonde caress my wife, Benny got in on the action too. My anger was already on the verge of exploding. Angela couldn't stop me. Ben Clausen was at least 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighed around 190 pounds. He was in good shape but couldn't match my size or strength. Something, perhaps a creaking floorboard or maybe just a sixth sense, warned him of the danger of my approach. He turned to me, his eyes wide in shock. He didn't make a sound, but at that moment, it didn't matter. I was too close for anyone to escape or try to resist. I walked past her without hitting her. 
she would get what she deserved for touching a married woman, but first, I wanted to deal with Benny. I grabbed him by the hair and pulled him back sharply, throwing him to the floor. Ah, he screamed in pain, trying to escape from my iron grip. Ah. Brittany screamed, surprised, her eyes widening. Ah, the stranger screamed, her eyes wide with fear. Shut up, everyone! I snapped, slamming Benny's head against the edge of the couch for added effect. The padding made the blow more of an insult than an injury, but it had the desired effect. The stranger braced herself, as if she was about to jump and run away. Without letting go of Benny's hair, I looked at her. I can only imagine the look on my face as I growled at her like a mad dog. Don't even think about running away, you dirty. If you run away before I give my permission, I will break you in half for touching my wife. I turned back to Ben. When he finally figured out how to free himself, instead of trying to escape, he guided his head into my hand, which allowed him to stand up. He hit me hard in the stomach. The pain only made me angrier. I responded by placing a heavy boot with a metal toe on his foot. He fell to his knees again and remained there. I took a moment to catch my breath. I looked at the other woman and realized that I actually knew her. I'd just never seen her without clothes. It was Jamie Keller. She lived with her parents in the last house on her block. She was studying to be a nurse or something in the health field. Brittany and I paid her to babysit when her parents couldn't. Jamie, I said, hardly believing my eyes. The girl nodded her head pathetically, trying to cover her without clothes with her hands. What the? Why are you? The words didn't come. Sorry, she said very quietly. How long have you been sleeping with my wife? I growled. This is only the second time, I swear, she said. I shouldn't have happened the first time. You dirty, I said, still furious. For me, cheating is cheating. It makes no difference whether Brittany had an affair with another man or woman. If she had a night with anyone other than me, it was cheating. I picked up the tablet that had fallen from Ben's hands when I interrupted what he was doing with Brittany and Jamie. I held it where she could see. I have a video of you doing very dirty things, I said. Get out of my house and never come back. If I find out that you've been in contact with my wife again, it doesn't matter if you just bumped into her at the mall. I'll post this on every adult site on the internet. I'll send links to your parents, grandparents, and anyone else. I'll tweet this to the world. I will do everything in my power to completely destroy your reputation so that you won't even be able to get a job as a toilet cleaner. Do you understand me? She looked at me in horror as I shook the tablet in front of her face. Yes, she whispered, scared to death. I understand. Fine, I barked. I'm done with you. Get out of here, you dirty. She gathered her clothes and tried to get dressed, but I stopped her. Oh no, I said angrily. Get out the front door just the way you were, without anything, like a dirty. When you're completely out, you can get dressed, but not before I see you take that shameful step. Move. I picked up the tablet and filmed her gathering her things and following my command. She awkwardly walked to the front door and left. I recorded her through the large windows as she quickly got dressed and then ran to her parents' house. Luckily for her, almost everyone in the area was at work, so the likelihood that someone saw her was minimal. Ben whined quietly, and I turned my attention back to him. He was still lying at the foot of the sofa, and I noticed that his left foot was already beginning to swell. It seemed to hurt. Poor thing. He looked at me with hatred but also saw his wife standing in the doorway, filming what was happening. He must have realized that his situation was hopeless, so he decided not to move. This showed more common sense than I expected from him. So, Benji, I said, pretending to be friendly. Haven't seen you since college, buddy. How are you? I kicked him with the toe of my shoe, and he flinched. Don't, he said, hurt. Don, Angela intervened. Yes, he's wounded, I answered. So what? Angela sighed irritably and walked over to the couch. She glanced at my wife with contempt, then knelt down next to her husband. His leg is clearly broken, she said as she examined the damage. You don't need an x-ray to see this. Damn it, Don, he may develop a blood clot. 
You could have killed him. She looked at me with some fear. If I wanted to kill him, I would have done it, I replied. However, I don't want to kill him or Jamie or Brittany for that matter. If I kill them, I will be imprisoned and I will never see my children again. I'm not so crazy that I don't understand this. But there's one more thing, you can only kill once. After that, you can no longer make them suffer, and of course, I want them to suffer. I looked at Ben carefully, then at Brittany. Oh yes, I want them both to feel pain. I suffered greatly, as if someone had torn out my heart. I want them to feel the same pain. I'm sure Ben has already received his share of pain, but our business isn't finished yet. Well, as they say, it takes two to tango. Well, in this case, apparently three, but who's counting, right? The point is that Brittany was clearly not taken by force. She was a freely consenting partner in all of this, and I was going to make sure the little got her share of misery. I took my phone out of my vest pocket and dialed a number on speed dial, making sure to put it on speaker. The phone was picked up after just three rings. Hi, George, I said, recognizing the voice of my father-in-law. Brittany squeezed her eyes shut when she heard his voice. When she opened them, she looked at me pleadingly, asking me not to do what she apparently already understood. Her pleas were useless. There was no way in hell I was going to let what she did happen without doing as much damage as possible to her life. Why should I be the only one who suffers, Don? He answered with obvious pleasure, glad to hear from me. What happened? He asked anxiously. Are the kids okay? The kids are fine, George, I reassured him. They're still at school. Unfortunately, this has to do with Brittany and me. I know that if I start telling you over the phone, you probably won't believe me. Instead of going through all this, I prefer to show you the hard evidence of what I'm about to tell you. My father-in-law was silent for a long time. When he spoke again, I realized he had an idea of what was going on. There was nothing surprising in this. I respected him from our first meeting and knew he was a smart man. Smart man. There were only a few reasons for such a call. If it's not related to his grandchildren but to Brittany and me, then we'll be there in 15 minutes or less, George said in a sad tone. Please don't do anything rash until we arrive. Don't worry, I replied. I will think very carefully about everything I am going to do. I ended the call and then called my parents. After a surprisingly similar conversation, I put my phone away. Brittany was sobbing her eyes out, curled up on one end of the couch. She tried to get dressed or at least cover herself with a blanket, but I stopped her with a look. She knew what I wanted. Brittany had to go through her own shameful journey too. Angela was not ready to support my theatrical plans. He needs a hospital, Don, she said calmly but firmly. I understand that you want to completely destroy your wife. I don't blame you, but there are limits to what I'm willing to do. Okay, I said. But how about this, instead of taking him to the hospital, how about calling an ambulance? She looked at me, appraising me. I saw in her eyes that she understood why I made this offer. It would take about 10 to 15 minutes for the ambulance to arrive. When they arrived, they would spend a few minutes assessing the patient's condition before sending him to the hospital. In other words, by offering an ambulance, I was trying to get her to stay longer without refusing her request to help the man with his broken leg. Her look said that she admired my ingenuity but not my cruelty. However, she sighed and nodded her head. Forget the sirens, Don, she said. A few more minutes won't make a big difference. But as soon as your revenge is complete, I must take him to the hospital. Do you understand me? Got it, I replied. You can keep the tablet and camera until you have copied all the data. Then return the camera. I need it for my own divorce. I don't care what you do with this tablet. Thank you, Angela, I said. She nodded and took out her phone, called the real estate agency, and told the person who answered that she had an emergency and that they would close the office for the day. Listening to this, I couldn't help but wonder why she was still with this worthless loser. He had already betrayed her once. She had already said she was going to get a divorce. Why stay? Damn it, if I were her, I'd have thrown him out faster than a grenade. My parents arrived first, they lived closer, so it didn't surprise me. I opened the door and let them in. 
My mom saw Brittany and Benny first and froze in place. Dad saw them a few seconds later and also stared in shock and confusion. Donnie, honey, what's going on? asked my mother. My father didn't say anything out loud, but his look spoke volumes. His face moved from a without clothes, sobbing Brittany to an angry Angela, then to a suffering and scantily clad Ben, and finally to me. I could see from his face that he didn't need any explanation. He put his hand on my shoulder and squeezed it comfortingly while my mother blushed at the sight of her daughter-in-law and two strangers. Donnie, she asked again, what on earth is happening? I carefully explained everything to them, leaving out no details, and offered to show them a video taken from two different devices. She quickly refused the offer, her face turning even redder. She took a blanket from the couch and tried to cover Brittany, but I stopped her. No, Mom, I said. I want George and Virginia to see the little, just the way she is. I want them to know without any doubt that I didn't ruin our marriage. Oh no, Donnie, please don't say that, Brittany exclaimed. Shut up. I answered. What did you think would happen? I walked in and saw you having an intim with two pieces of human trash, and you thought I wouldn't want a divorce? You must be one of the stupidest people I have ever met. She shrank and curled up into a little ball, shivering on the couch while we waited for her parents to arrive. Luckily for me, I didn't have to wait long. My in-laws, George and Virginia Carson, arrived a few minutes later. They quickly walked to the front door where my father greeted them and let them inside. My mother-in-law, Virginia, greeted my parents with surprise, but my father-in-law, George, did not seem surprised to see them. I wondered if he had talked much to Virginia about his suspicions. My God, Brittany, what are you doing? Virginia screamed when she saw her daughter huddled on the sofa. She walked towards her daughter but stopped, almost tripping over Ben. Who is this? she asked. What the hell is going on here? Well, I said, should I tell them, or should you? When Brittany didn't make a sound, I told everyone how my morning had gone, starting with problems with file recovery and my discovery through a bird's eye view. I then talked about the results of my web search and subsequent meeting with Angela. After that, I described what I found when I entered the house. All the parents were silent. Of course, this didn't last long. Donald, Virginia began, there must be some terrible mistake. There's no way Brittany would do something like that. I have video from two different devices that disproves this, Virginia, I said calmly. Would you like to see it? I took the SD card out of Angela's camera and walked towards the TV. I was going to show them this. I didn't respect Brittany anymore, so I didn't care if she was embarrassed. I wasn't going to let anyone doubt me. No, son, please don't, said my mother, her voice full of sympathy and compassion but with a hint of steel. This won't solve anything, honey. It will only hurt people. I won't let anyone doubt the truth, I said firmly. If anyone doubts that I am right, I want to resolve it here and now. Don, George said, raising his hand in a conciliatory gesture, what are you going to do next? I think this is the most important question. I looked at him, and my expression probably conveyed at least part of my feelings. What did he think I was going to do? Sorry. George, but divorce is the only option, I said. I don't want to live with this, and I certainly don't want to see it every day. From the corner of my eye, I saw Angela helping Ben to his feet. I didn't bother her as she gathered his clothes. I also, with great effort, did not laugh when she made him limp to the car parked in her driveway, wearing only his socks. It was fair to make him go through a man's path of shame, I thought. George Carson's face hardened when he heard me call his daughter it but he decided not to make an issue of it for now. First, I began, I want custody of the children. I will give Brittany free visits, but they will live with me. This is not up for discussion. Wait a minute, Donald, Virginia said. I know you're hurt and angry, but... I interrupted her objection. I hold all the cards. I'll get what I demand, or Brittany will be the last amateur adult film star to hit the internet. Do we all understand each other? I turned away from them and looked at Brittany. More importantly, do you understand? I told her. She looked at me, her anger finally beginning to replace her humiliation and shame. Don't call me that again, she screamed. 
I don't care, I shouted back. You're nothing but a dirty trash can, and I'll be damned if I allow you to raise our daughter to be like you. As you can imagine, things devolved into a shouting match. At this point, I wasn't ready to give an inch, and neither Brittany nor my in-laws were willing to give in. We spent two hours yelling at each other, but then I remembered it was almost time for the school bus to return. I looked with hateful eyes at the woman I once loved more than anything in the world. It's almost time for the kids to come home, I hissed angrily. Go take a shower and get dressed before they come. Then we'll tell them why mom doesn't live here anymore. Never, she answered. I'll tell them myself why their father doesn't live here anymore. Oh yeah? I said dangerously. Okay, do your fabulous work. I'll be in the office. Let me know if you change your mind, but if I were you, I wouldn't wait too long on this. As Brittany and both of our parents watched, I headed toward the office where everyone knew we had a home computer. I wasn't kidding, and they seemed to understand that either I get what I want or this would see her intimate tapes spreading like STDs in a fraternity. Brittany rushed towards me. No, no, she screamed. Wait. Damn it, I said. You know the court won't give you custody nowadays. I could commit cold-blooded murder on the steps of the court and still get custody, she said. Not if you tell the judge you don't want her, I answered. She looked at me. I stared straight back, not hiding my rage and pain from her. In fact, I wanted her to know how hurt I was, but apparently, she wasn't going to give in. So I shrugged and turned away again. Damn it, Don, you can't do that, she screamed. Is it true? I asked. I'm sure, she said. Look, it's easy. You won't do this, she said. I know you won't do this to me. You love me. Is it true? I asked. Don't kid yourself. I will really do this and take wicked pleasure in it. Never in my life did I think that the love of my life would cheat on me. Well, I was wrong about that, wasn't I? Plus, I just found out my wife likes girls. That's a nice touch. I'm learning a lot today, and I have to say it wasn't fun. She started crying again, but I can honestly say that I didn't care anymore. I was emotionally exhausted and just wanted to get it over with. Do you hate me so much that you'll actually do this? She asked. Yes, I answered. I will never forgive you for what I saw today, and if you don't give me everything I want in a divorce, I will dedicate the rest of my life to destroying you, even if I destroy myself in the process. I stopped again for a moment, looking at the little, I had no idea how long she had been available to other people. Well, other people, to be exact, since I had clear evidence that it wasn't just men like Daniel and Brian. Brittany, how can you ask that, she said, shocked. How can you cheat on me with multiple partners? I snapped. Seriously now, I won't believe you if you say the earth is round. I thought you loved me. I loved you and trusted you with all my heart because there was no way you would betray me. Now I don't know what to believe. I never dreamed that you would turn out to be a dirty. I shook my head, disgusted, angry, and hurt. I put the SD card in my pocket and made sure I had a firm grip on the tablet. Then I turned away from the office and returned to the living room. Brittany followed closely behind me. I heard my parents and her parents talking in the living room as I approached. Do you really think he'll do this, Frank? It could ruin poor Brittany's future, Virginia said. Honestly, Virginia, after what she did to my son, I couldn't care less about her future. What she did is nothing short of heinous, and she deserves every bit of crap she gets for it, came the voice of my father. And all you can think about is poor Brittany? What nonsense. What about my son? What about his broken heart, huh? I entered the room just then. Everyone looked at me, and Virginia looked a little nervous. I gave her a look of complete disgust and shook my head, but didn't waste any energy commenting. Brittany was her daughter, and I guessed she couldn't help but support her. Look, Don, I don't think it's fair to insist on custody, Virginia began. At their age, children need a mother. I'm sorry, Mrs. Carson, I said, but I made it clear to you that I don't care. Look, fight all you want you know what the consequences will be. I'm a little surprised that neither of you care that your daughter is a cheater, but okay. Just wanted you to know you can leave now. 
I would appreciate it if you took your daughter with you, but you probably won't. They both looked at me as if I had just hit them. Then they started talking over each other, telling me how rude I was and how they hoped Brittany would take everything from me in the divorce, and so on. You might be shocked to learn that things didn't go the way they both wanted. Okay, so you probably won't be that surprised. Life will mock you in every possible way. Plus, Brittany may have been exaggerating when she talked about how the courts work these days, but not by much. I really didn't think Brittany would be stupid enough to call my bluff about the video, but she did. The problem for her was that I wasn't bluffing. If I say I will do something, I will do it. When the judge awarded her custody, Brittany gave me the biggest grin I'd ever seen. I simply grinned back at her. As soon as I returned to the room my parents had allowed me to use, I collected the tablet that Ben had left behind and drove to the nearest coffee shop. I used their Wi-Fi to upload my edited composite video to every adult site I could find. In addition to using Ben's tablet, I used his email address to send links to every member of Brittany's family I could think of. After that, I threw the tablet into the river. I also posted links on Ben's social media. True to her word, Brittany became a minor celebrity among adult film lovers. Just a month after I posted my masterpiece, she lost her job at the gym because of it, but she still retained custody. Luckily, since the divorce was finalized before she was fired, I did not have to pay spousal support. It was a small mercy, but I would take any I could get. She tried to get a share in the family business, but in this matter, she was a complete fiasco. She didn't do her homework, you see. I don't get ownership of the business until my father dies. At the moment, he is the owner. I just manage it for him. He pays my salary. I have never invested my own money or our joint money into the business. Everything I invested while running the business came from a fund my father started a long time ago, so at least it was safe from my financially predatory ex-spouse. The judge awarded Brittany $600 a month in child support. My lawyer couldn't stop it, but he was able to defer payments until the results of the children's paternity tests were received. I pushed for the test mostly to hurt Brittany, not because I actually doubted I was their father. Regardless, it was a huge relief when I received the lab results with proof that they were mine. Brittany got half of our savings and half of our checking account. She, however, did not receive the house. She simply couldn't afford it with the money she earned. My lawyer was able to force the sale of the house. Don't ask me how, I really don't want to know. We split the money from the sale and she bought another smaller house in the same school district. I felt a little sorry for the children. I know they loved their home, but I just couldn't bear the thought of my ex-wife benefiting so much from her betrayal. I also bought a small three-bedroom house in the same school area. I had to set some really draconian limits on my spending to afford it with the child support I had to pay, but I managed. My father wanted me to increase my salary, but I told him no. If I did that, the courts would just increase the amount of child support, so it wouldn't help me. Daniel and Brian at least seemed happy with my new home but they didn't like that their mother and I were no longer together. I tried my best to occupy their little minds with other things. We often went to the park and rode our bikes on the trails or went hiking. Sometimes, if I had extra money, we would go swimming at the aquatic center. We had a lot of fun together. On a personal level, I was lonely. Brittany was a wonderful lover and we had a rich and frequent night life. Once the divorce was finalized, I started dating again. I did nothing wrong and saw no reason why I should remain without someone special in my life. I had no problems attracting female attention, so getting dates was easy. The intim was usually good, but I just couldn't connect with anyone. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with calling a friend for intimate, but it gets old quickly. I wanted more than just that. I wanted a relationship again. The children sometimes told me about their mother. I knew why they did it and it didn't make me angry. They still didn't know why we broke up, and I hoped it would stay that way. By telling me about their mother, they tried to interest me. They weren't used to having two separate households, and they didn't like it. I don't blame them, but I asked them to stop several times. I no longer loved or cared for their mother, and nothing they said would ever bring us back together. About six months after the divorce, I ran into Mandy Thomas, one of the personal trainers at the gym where Brittany worked, well, used to work. 
I was at the grocery store, restocking. The week that had just passed was my week with the kids, and they had almost completely emptied the cupboards. Hello, stranger, her cheerful voice rang out. Oh, hi Mandy, I said. How are you? Not bad, thank you. But more importantly, how are you? I shrugged and smiled. I'm fine, I think. Work and go home, work and go home mostly. I'm looking forward to my weeks with the kids. They're raring to go for Christmas, even though Halloween isn't even here yet. She laughed along with me, and I couldn't help but admire her toned figure, bright green eyes, and shining red hair. I was a little surprised that she also looked at me as I looked at her. Last I heard, Mandy had a boyfriend, but maybe she was single now. Her next words confirmed that she was thinking similar things. So, are you seeing someone now, Don? Nothing serious, I said, shrugging again. Honestly, I just can't get along with anyone. I understand, she said, leaning forward and gently touching my arm. Mandy was taller than Brittany by at least seven inches. The top of her head reached approximately to my nose, which meant that she didn't have to lean back far to look me in the eye. I liked it. In fact, I thought to myself, I'm sure I could actually love her. She was attractive, smart, funny, and probably a real tigress in bed. Her soft laugh brought me out of my thoughts. Do you like what you see, Don? She asked, her eyes sparkling. Yes, I said quietly, deciding to try. I really like what I see, Mandy. I wanted to see if you have plans for dinner tonight. I don't really have any plans for the evening, she replied, taking a step closer to me. Then how about you come to my place, and I'll cook dinner for you? I suggested, gently hugging her thin waist and pulling her towards me. And then we can talk about dessert. My relationship with Mandy greatly improved the self-confidence I didn't even realize I had lost. She was an inventive and responsive lover. She turned out to be even smarter than I thought. She was funny and good with children. She was also a great listener and friend. We agreed to be exclusive after our third date, and I haven't regretted it for a moment. There was something about this woman that I found irresistible. With her, I had the very company I had been looking for for so long. I guess you could say she made me whole, if that doesn't sound too sentimental. Regardless of the terminology, I was happy, really happy, for the first time since the divorce. Mandy and I had been together for a few months when I received an unexpected call from my ex-in-laws. Hello, I said. Hello, Donald, this is George Carson. Yes, George, what do you want? I asked without much enthusiasm. I used to love George, but that ended during the divorce. I admit my actions in turning Britney into a star in the adult film world didn't help, but hey, these things happen when you're dealing with a person who thinks they have nothing to lose. I wanted to let you know that we have the children now, he said. Britney is in the hospital, in Virginia, and I want to stay with her. Could you come and get them? Of course, no problem. When would be convenient? I asked. George didn't answer immediately. He probably expected me to ask why my ex was in the hospital. It was stupid of him. Why the hell should I care? Any time will do, really, he said finally. But if you don't mind, I'd like you to pick them up by 6 o'clock in the evening. No problem, I said. I'm not busy right now, so I'll come right away. Don't you care that Brittany is in the hospital, he asked before I could end the call. No, not particularly, I said unless it's something contagious that could harm the children. Is that so? No, said George heavily. She's not in that kind of hospital. She's in the Katrina Center. Ah, I thought to myself. The Katrina Center was a mental hospital. Although in today's politically correct climate, such a name would be unacceptable, they called it the Mental Health and Stress Relief Clinic. Okay, whatever. Well, as long as it doesn't affect the kids, I don't care, I said without hesitation and ended the call. I finished my business, locked the office, and hurried to the Carson house. It was about 20 minutes away, and as I drove, I thought about Brittany. I didn't think about it often now, however, I was wondering again why this little had ruined our marriage and torn our family apart. I had thought about this many times after the divorce but never got around to asking her about it. 
I didn't trust or respect my ex and didn't think she would tell me the truth. I went through the usual reasons cheating spouses give and rejected most of them. Here are some of the possible reasons I considered for her cheating. I don't know, and it doesn't matter anymore. The moment I saw her with someone else, our marriage ended. Cheating is unforgivable for me. If you are not capable of being faithful, do not get married. Yes, it really is that simple. Society these days is very accepting of people who don't get married, so there's no reason to get married and then cheat. If I had forgiven her and stayed with her, I would have lost every ounce of self-respect I had. My arrival at my former in-law's house finally stopped the flow of depressive thoughts. Their front door swung open as I pulled up to the gravel driveway leading to the house. Daniel and Brian were waiting for me. As I walked out and headed for the door, I immediately realized that all was not well with them. Brian stood very close to his older sister. For her part, Danielle wrapped one arm around him, protecting him. The children got along well with each other, but this behavior was not typical. George stood behind them, one hand touching each of them. He looked at me with a bitter, angry look as I walked up the short stairs. When I reached the porch, he leaned towards the children. Children, he said softly, I need to talk to your dad for a minute. Please go inside and make sure all your things are packed. One of us will come get you when it's time to leave, okay? Okay, Grandpa, Danielle answered for both of them. They turned and walked inside, leaving me on the porch with their grandfather. He gave me a hateful look the likes of which I had never seen from him before. I just looked at him neutrally, waiting for him to say whatever was on his mind. What's wrong with you, Don, he finally said. Other than a little nearsightedness, I'd say I'm fine, thanks for asking. Stop being a smartass. You know what I mean. He flared up angrily. Your wife is in a mental hospital, and you don't care. First of all, she is not my wife, I snapped. She herself destroyed our marriage of her own free will and with full knowledge of the consequences. And secondly, you're right, I don't care. I don't see any reason why I should. And I don't understand why you're so angry about it. I didn't cheat on her, she cheated on me, you idiot. It's all your fault she ended up in the hospital, he retorted. You posted that video on the internet. You completely ruined her reputation, and she had a terrible time finding a job that suited her qualifications. I told you I would do this if I didn't get what I wanted. She was warned in advance, but she decided to fight me anyway. She reaped the fruits of her actions. And by the way, if she doesn't earn what she's worth, she should talk to my pimp about it, I said coldly. Or does she freelance? You an idiot, he shouted, grabbing me by the vest. I grabbed his wrist and easily removed his hand from my clothes. I did my best to be gentle. I didn't want to hurt him, but no one has the right to touch me. Think very carefully before you try to use force on me, George, I said quietly and calmly. I know you love Brittany, but the truth is that everything that happened to her was her fault. You can blame me for everything you want, but even you should understand the truth. Besides, if it was you, wouldn't you do the same thing as me? I held his wrist tightly until he finally relaxed his hand. I let go of him and carefully stepped back. He looked more defeated than anything else, but I wanted to make sure he didn't try to hit me. I don't know, maybe I will, he said. I guess it's easier to be mad at you than to admit that my daughter. He fell silent and shook his head in furious denial. After a few moments of collecting his thoughts, he looked at me again and took a deep breath. Will you at least let me tell you what's going on? He asked. Okay, go ahead, I said, annoyed. If George noticed my tone, he decided not to mention it. Brittany tried to kill herself, he said bluntly. Do the children know what she did? I asked. Yes, he said, closing his eyes in pain. Danielle found her mother unconscious on the bed and called 911. Brittany appeared to have deliberately taken an entire bottle of sleeping pills. When she didn't come out of her room when the kids came home, Danielle went to check on her. He sighed heavily, rubbing his eyes with his hands. His shoulders shook slightly, and I felt a bit of pity for him. He wasn't responsible for what his daughter did to me. I felt terrible for my children, though. I honestly can't imagine how Danielle felt when she found her mother in that state. 
I was also proud of my little girl for not losing her head in a crisis and doing the right thing. I made a mental note to tell her that. How are they coping with what happened? I asked. Daniel and Brian are both very upset, but I think it was especially hard for Brian, George replied. Danielle didn't leave his side all night. I nodded slowly. Thanks for telling me. I'll keep a close eye on them, I said. I watched them really closely over the next few days. I spoke to both of them about what happened to their mother. After several weeks of treatment, Brittany was discharged. She was declared cured, I think, but I didn't believe it. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I don't understand how just talking to a professional and maybe taking pills can solve problems so serious that she thought suicide would solve them. She insisted that we return to the previous arrangement on the general upbringing of the children, which we had observed all this time. I asked my kids what they thought of this idea. Danielle clearly had her doubts, but Brian was full of enthusiasm, almost jumping with desire to spend time with his mother. Unless you want to go through a long and grueling legal battle again, you're going to have to give her what she asks for, Mandy said when I told her how I felt. You can try to convince the judge that you're right. After all, attempting suicide is pretty strong evidence of an unfit parent. Mandy's voice was calm, but her eyes told a different story. From the way they peered at me, it was clear how she felt about this. My own feelings were mixed. I was still furious with Brittany. I couldn't bear the thought of giving her access to the children again, but Brian, at least, made his desire clear. He wanted to spend time with both his mother and me. Daniel, I knew, would go with his brother to keep an eye on him. I'm not going to try to keep Brittany from seeing the kids, I finally said. Mandy's gaze softened. No, I didn't think you were like that, she said. But on the other hand, I don't want the children to go through the trauma of their mother trying to commit suicide again. I don't know what happened to her to turn her into such a selfish, irresponsible person, but there's no denying that it happened, I said. Mandy sat back on the couch next to me, thoughtful. Then she sighed quietly. Should we talk about something more pleasant than her? I suggested, affectionately stroking her hand. Mandy smiled and kissed me lightly. I'm always ready to talk about something pleasant, she said. What did you have in mind? Here it was, the moment of truth. Over the past few months, I had become closer to Mandy. She was everything I wanted in a woman. She spent most nights at home with me, sharing my life even during my weeks with the children. Finally, I decided it was time to propose. This was only the second time in my life I'd done this, and I was nervous as hell. As I pulled the ring box out of my pocket, I said, we could talk about our future, Mandy. I love you, and so do the kids. I love being with you and I hate being without you. I opened the box with the ring and handed it to her. Will you marry me? Her eyes became huge as she looked into the ring box. I told the children about my intentions. Not only did they approve, but they also helped me choose this ring. Mandy's eyes lifted from the box to look at me, and her gaze was sad. This was not what I expected. She reached out and gently closed the lid of the box. Don, this is a very beautiful ring, and I'm touched. I really like you, but marriage, really? Mandy shook her head softly. Don, dear, you are a wonderful lover, and from what I have seen, you are a wonderful father to your children. You are a good man and you have treated me like a princess since we've been together. You would be a good husband, but not for me. I leaned back on the sofa. I don't understand. If I'm a really good person and all, why don't you want to marry me? I asked. I thought we got along so well together. We could be really happy and build a wonderful life. But Mandy shook her head, her eyes sad. She gently reached out and stroked my face, brushing away a tear I hadn't even noticed. Don, honey, it's not just about you, Mandy said softly. Part of the problem is me. I'm not sure I even want to get married. But if I ever do, it won't be to a man who already has kids and an ex he has to deal with regularly. We've spent a lot of fun times together. Don, and I don't regret a second of our time together, she paused, looking at the floor before meeting my gaze again. Don, I thought it was just fun. I offered to be exclusive with you because I hate protection and I don't want to get an STD. 
It's not because I wanted to get married. I felt like the crushed remains of my heart were stuck in my diaphragm. This must have been the reason why I lost my breath, but I didn't make a sound. She had already started tearing my feelings apart, so I might as well let her finish the job. Looking back, I can see why you might think exclusivity meant more than just a good time. I'm sorry. I really didn't mean to deceive you. In fact, it never occurred to me that you might want to get married again, given what happened to you, she said. I understand, I said quietly. I removed my hand and looked at the ring box still in my palm. Sighing, I shrugged and casually tossed it over my shoulder, not caring where it landed. Thank you for being honest with me, Mandy, I said. I'm sorry for bothering you with my problems. Please forget I said anything about it. I already knew that there was no point in apologizing. Mandy had already picked up her coat and purse. Realizing what would happen next, I stood up and met her at the door. I opened it and watched her come out. She stopped on the threshold for a moment and looked into my eyes. She seemed to want to say something but didn't. We exchanged glances for a moment before I leaned in to kiss her goodbye one last time. She turned her head away, and my kiss fell on her cheek. Wow, I thought, I'm not even worth a goodbye kiss. I realized that there was no more hope for us, so I closed and locked the door behind her. The weeks after Mandy left my life were difficult. I'd been dumped before, but somehow, with Mandy, it hurt more than most of the previous times. Maybe because she was the first woman I connected with emotionally, not just physically. At first, the children asked me why Mandy left our lives. They asked why she said no, why she didn't want to see us anymore. I said it wasn't about them, it was about me. Danielle, who had just turned 10, was very perceptive for her age. Judging by the look in her eyes, she might have guessed more than I was willing to say. If so, she was kind enough to let me get away with my version. As time went on, my son Brian mentioned his mother at every opportunity when it was my turn with them. Of my two children, Brian missed our old family life the most. I wasn't surprised that he was trying to get mom and dad back together. To a certain extent, this was expected. All I could do was continue living my life. Yes, there were dates, and yes, some of them ended happily. After all the events I had experienced, I tried to ensure that everyone I met understood my expectations. No misunderstandings. However, this was not a problem. None of the women I dated wanted anything permanent with a man in my circumstances. There were, of course, exceptions. I dated a few single moms who might have been interested in something more until I talked about my crazy, suicidal ex. Then they usually found a reason not to go on another date. Some didn't want to subject their own child to such drama. Others didn't want it for themselves either. I guess I don't blame them, but it made life lonely. I still talk to Angela from time to time. She divorced Ben, but she didn't completely destroy him, so to speak. She didn't want to keep the huge house she shared with Ben. She said it was full of too many memories. Plus, she wanted a house that was a home and not a status symbol. So she and Ben sold the house, split the money, and each bought another house. She didn't want to sell her share of Ben's real estate business, so she didn't ask for the maximum alimony she could get. She also didn't quit her office job, although she did everything possible to minimize contact with her ex. I admit she was stronger than me. There's no way in hell I would have volunteered to spend so much time with Brittany. However, she deserves my respect. Ben didn't get as much fame for his role in the homemade porn I posted. I don't know why, and to be honest, I didn't care. It didn't seem to hurt his business, at least as far as I could see. Angela never brought it up in her conversations, and I certainly wasn't going to bring it up. I had other reasons for this. Angela never attacked me for posting that video. She predicted that I wouldn't get custody of the kids unless Brittany gave it to me, and of course, we all knew Brittany would never do this. Thus, the release of the video was inevitable. However, I was perceptive enough to notice how angry she was that I did this. She wanted me to use it as evidence in the divorce and was horrified when I said I would actually do it to him. I think part of her doubted that I would go all the way. In case anyone is wondering, no, Angela and I were never together. We're too different in so many ways to ever be happy together, and we're both mature enough to understand that. We are friends, 
and she has always been there when I needed someone to commiserate with. Her son Robert often visited my house since he and Brian were in the same class at the same school and got along well with each other. During one of her visits to my house, Angela found a box with a ring. I never tried to look for it after Mandy left. It wasn't worth looking for, I could have sold it and made some money, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Angela found it under the edge of an old closet in the living room and brought it to me with a questioning look. I looked at the slightly dusty box lying on the coffee table and sighed. Angela's raised eyebrow was a silent hint that she wouldn't let the topic go until I explained, so I took a mental breath and told her about how I proposed to Mandy and what the results were. Angela listened in silence. When the pitiful story was over, she shook her head sadly. I'm sorry to hear that, Don, she said. Um, thanks, I replied, but you don't have to feel sorry for my failures. I'm just not good at choosing people when it comes to relationships. The truth is, the only woman on the planet who thought I was worth being with turned out to be a cheater. Funny, come to think of it. Well, welcome to the club, she said with a grin. Apparently, I'm no better at choosing men than you are at choosing women. We both exchanged short, bitter laughs, but she was lying a little, and we both knew it. She had a man with whom she was dating exclusively. They had been together for about a month. I don't know if she saw wedding bells in her future, but I've met this guy and would be very surprised if he didn't propose at some point. Do you think the problem might be me? I asked after a while. I don't know. Don, she answered with the frankness I'd come to expect from her. Perhaps you have unresolved issues that are preventing you from connecting with someone. I know that the fact that you never found out why your ex cheated bothers you. Honestly, I don't know why you never tried to find out, but that's your business. She looked at me appraisingly and frowned. Your appearance is definitely not the problem, she said, looking me over. I think I even blushed a little. Look, I'm no professional but I think you need to talk to her, Brittany, I mean. Do you really think talking to my ex will help my love life? I asked doubtfully. Well, at this point, what do you have to lose? She asked. Good question, I admitted. I guess it can't hurt. That Sunday, when I dropped the kids off at Brittany's house, I got out of the car with them instead of just dropping them off. My son and daughter looked at me in surprise. I'd never gotten out of the car at their mother's house before. Brian looked worried, and Danielle looked concerned. I need to talk to your mother for a minute, I told them firmly. I'm not going back to her and I'm not going to make a scene, okay? They nodded silently as I decisively walked to the door and knocked. I knocked twice more before Brittany finally opened the door. She still amazed me with her appearance. She was as beautiful as ever, even in her cafe uniform, where she worked as the day shift manager. Her blonde hair had grown a little longer, it was wavy and probably as soft and silky as ever. I didn't dare touch it to be sure. Why do you knock, children, when you know that I leave the door unlocked for you, she said, stopping when she saw me standing there. Her eyes widened in surprise, then narrowed in anger. What do you want, she asked, barely polite. I want to talk to you for a minute, please, I said. About what, she demanded. I silently looked at our two children, who were still standing on the porch, watching us with wide eyes and a mixture of fear and surprise. She didn't seem to get the hint, so I explained it directly. Can we discuss this in private? Okay, she hissed. Get in the house, you two. Now. As soon as they entered the house and closed the door, she continued, what does the great and powerful Donald need to discuss with this poor sinner? It must be something desperately important. I want to know why you cheated on me, I said simply. What? she asked, surprised. I want to know why, I repeated. I heard you. Damn it, she said sharply. But why are you asking me this now? It's been over a year. Damn it, it's been almost 18 months. If you really cared, why didn't you ask then? I was so furious at what you did that I didn't care why you did it, I answered honestly. But now that time has passed, I want to know why you destroyed our marriage and family. You're going to put all the blame on me, right? Well, you're the one who decided to have a night with other people, I said in a reasonable tone. I never cheated on you. I didn't even think about it. What I had was too precious for me, and I always thought I could trust the love of my life. 
If you don't want to tell me, just say so and I'll leave. I really didn't think you'd tell me anyway. Brittany's blue eyes bored into me, her anger obvious. I just couldn't understand this anger. Her circumstances were the result of her own actions. All she had to do was be a faithful wife, and none of this would have happened. How difficult was it? But damn, even if she couldn't do it, she could at least have divorced me before she started cheating. If she had done it this way, I wouldn't have lost all respect for her, but she couldn't even do that for the man she promised to love and protect until death do us part. I watched her face for several minutes, noting the variety of emotions playing on it like on a movie screen. Finally, she seemed to resolve some internal struggle. Her eyes dropped to the floor for a few moments as she collected her thoughts. Finally, she raised her face and looked into my eyes. I, she faltered. For a long time, I had desires to be with another woman. Her voice was very quiet, I had to strain to hear her. Why didn't you do this in college, before we met? I asked. I tried a couple of times, but I always gave up, she said. I was afraid that my parents would somehow find out, and I was also afraid that my friends would think I was somehow different just because I wanted to experiment. After a few moments to collect her thoughts, she continued, Jamie used to talk to me when she came to the gym. One day, she admitted that she too had these desires. I told her she was lucky, bisexuality is much less stigmatized in women these days. She could experiment without fear. At first, I didn't realize that the woman she wanted to experiment with was me. She looked into my eyes and gave me a mirthless smile. One night, when I was working closing, she managed to catch me alone in the women's locker room. It was amazing how she made me feel. I knew after the first time that I could never leave her. So you've decided that you're gay? I asked, hardly believing it. I was so sure that this was not the answer. No, I don't like women, Brittany shook her head. But I'm definitely bisexual. She paused again, apparently trying to find the words to explain herself. But it was more than that. I knew how you felt about monogamy, and I knew that even if I could leave Jamie, it wouldn't matter to you. This one time wouldn't be acceptable to you. Well, I admit you were right about that, I said. I made that clear from the very beginning. Yes, you did, she agreed. So it was so easy to throw away everything we've built over the last 11 years for a quick adventure with another woman, I said nonchalantly. In fact, I felt worse than before. I don't know what I expected to hear, but it certainly wasn't this. I didn't say it was easy, Donnie, she said. For the first time in a long time, I saw something other than hatred in her expression. Damn it, Brittany, this couldn't have been too hard for you. After all this time, I still can't believe what you did, I said. Despite my reassurances to the children, I felt my temper flare. After a second or two, I had it rain in again, but it wasn't easy. What about Benny, the man? I asked. Where does this stupid freak fit in? He's definitely not the other woman, Brittany said with a sigh. He came to the gym and signed up for a spinning class that I was teaching. We started talking, and eventually, he became one of my personal gym clients. He started reminiscing about the time we spent together in college. After a while, he started insisting on a little fun on the side, but I always rejected him. She paused, lost in her memories, and turned away from me. I didn't pressure her. What she said was disgusting and painful, but it rang true. If Angela was right, then I needed to hear it all. Finally, she turned to me again. Besides my fantasies about being with another woman, I also had fantasies about intimate with multiple partners. After that night when Jamie and I made love, the barriers to fulfilling my fantasies were broken down. I knew I was already doomed if you ever found out what I did. I also knew you'd never agree to a threesome, but Ben was excited about the idea. He wanted some time alone with me first, so I did. I slept with him for a couple of weeks and finally got my threesome. It was great until you ruined it this time. Her voice was indifferent, not accusatory. In a twisted, sick way, I could understand why she might feel the way she did. She was right, her intimate with Jamie was more than enough reason for divorce. With that in mind, why not fulfill your other fantasies since she's in such a mess? It's better to go all out, right? I shook my head. 
I almost regret asking, I said. Angela thought that finding out why you cheated on me would make me feel better, but instead, I felt even worse. I wasn't enough for you, and you didn't even respect me enough to say it to my face. You just decided to get whatever you wanted without giving a damn about me. Brittany shrugged her small shoulders. It didn't seem that way to me, Don, she said. Or at least, I didn't think about things in those terms. I don't know if this will help you or not, but the truth is that I just didn't think about you at all until everything happened. Only then did I think about the consequences. I really didn't mean to hurt you or ruin our marriage. My mom says I'm a terribly weak person, and she's probably right. I wanted to say something angry, but I stopped myself. It didn't make sense. I'd already said everything. In a strange way, I began to realize that Angela was right. Now that the initial pain had subsided, I actually felt a little better. I learned that it wasn't I who pushed her away, but her own desires that led her to betrayal. Her mother was right, she was terribly weak. Throwing away 11 years of marriage, a nice home, and a family for a stupid romance was the most foolish thing I've ever heard, but it's not my fault. Have you ever loved me, Brittany? I asked quietly. Of course I did, she answered. Part of me still does, I guess. I mean, aside from the impact it had on our kids. I'm sorry I hurt you too. That must mean there's still love. Have you ever been faithful to me? I asked. Yes, I was completely faithful to you until that night when Jamie and I made love, she replied. I'm afraid that whole year, I was, well, I was. She lowered her head again and took a deep breath. My therapist helped me understand that what I was doing was wrong, she said without looking up. Then her voice became angry again. But you shouldn't have ruined everything. You seriously damaged my relationship with my parents. You ruined my reputation so much that I can't find a job in my field. I don't even think moving to another state will help. And you ruined poor Jamie too. She doesn't talk to me anymore, but I heard from others that she was also slandered when you posted that video. How could you do this to me? Hey, I warned you that I would do this if I didn't get what I wanted in the divorce. You could have avoided all of this, but you chose your stupid pride. You thought I was lying just like you, but I'm not lying. I do what I say. Of all people, you should have known this, Brittany. Don't you dare blame me for your problems, I said indignantly. She shook her head angrily. No, you're crazy. You had to take revenge because your stupid male ego was hurt. You were full of grievances because I needed more than you were willing to give. No, Brittany, I said quietly. If that was the case, you should have come to me and told me that to my face like an adult and divorced me. I would have been terribly angry, I would probably have hated you, but I would still have respected you. I looked at my ex-wife with contempt. Instead, you decided to let things slide and be a useless, you're not even worth as much as a regular street girl. At least they're honest about what they are. It scares me to think that a person like you will have an impact on our two young, impressionable children. But the courts have made their decision, and I can't stop it. I can only pray that your mental disorder ends with you. I looked at her with contempt. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she looked at me. Damn it, I knew this was a bad idea. There was too much anger and hatred between us for a calm conversation. It's not that I said anything I didn't believe, but I really wasn't going to get into that today. Oh well, at least I got the answers I was looking for. I decided to walk away and let Brittany drown in her misery. I turned to leave, but to my surprise, Brittany stopped me. Don, wait. I have questions too, she said. Which are? I asked incredulously. Why were you so ready to give up on me? Why didn't you fight for me? She asked. This is a ridiculous question, I answered sharply. You don't remember any of the conversations we had while we were dating? We talked about cheating and how it destroys families. I told you then that cheating is the one thing I can't forgive. I will never tolerate it. You knew this before we got engaged, let alone married. From the moment you slept with someone else, there was nothing left to fight for. She trembled slightly, and a soft sob escaped her lips, but she steadfastly wiped her eyes and gathered the strength to ask her next question. How do you know? she asked. 
we were so careful, and you never changed your habits. I let out an emotionless chuckle. Believe it or not, it was purely an accident, I said. I continued to tell her the whole story of that terrible morning. As I spoke, her eyes gradually widened more and more. When I finally finished, she sat down on one of the cheap metal chairs she kept on her porch. This story is so incredible that it almost has to be true, she said. Google Earth of all things. I looked like a god, I said bitterly, but with some dark humor. Honestly, if this happened to anyone else, it would be funny. Life is like this sometimes. Is there anything else you wanted to ask? I finally asked. No, she said very quietly. She looked at me for a long moment. When she spoke again, she really surprised me. Don, I'm so sorry. Really truly sorry for my selfishness, she said. I know I have no right to be angry at you. My therapist says I'm actually angry at myself. It just shows up as anger at you. Anyway, I told the kids that our divorce was my fault, not yours. Of course, I didn't tell them the details, but I told them this. Thanks for saying that, Brittany, I said. It eases my mind a little bit, at least for the kids' sake. Then I turned and left. This was the last time in a long while that we spoke to each other face to face. Another year has passed, and my personal life has remained about the same. I still dated a willing woman from time to time, but no relationship was in the offing. Rarely, if ever, was anything expected. I had almost resigned myself to a life of night without love. I had heard the phrase time heals all wounds many times in my life, and I think there is some truth in it. Time seemed to drag on at its own sweet pace, but I noticed that I was gradually letting go of my bitterness. I enjoyed spending time with my children, watching them grow and learn has been one of the true joys of my life. Brian, although only 10 years old, was already showing interest in the family business. He enjoyed helping me with the plants, especially the Japanese-style rock and sand gardens. Danielle seemed to gravitate more toward a career in healthcare, although she also had plenty of time to change her mind, she was only 12. Speaking of her tender age, it seems she has begun to understand that boys are not necessarily the rude and disgusting creatures she once believed them to be. Some of them were exciting. I knew this stage of her growth would come soon, but I didn't expect it to come now. It was my increased protectiveness toward Danielle that led me to volunteer to chaperone the children's sock activities at school that fall. To be fair, Angela and her new husband, Mike, also worked hard to get me to agree to help. If you have kids this age, you probably know how to get parents involved in this sort of thing. So I watched a bunch of kids get high on sugar and jump around the school gym. The music was incredibly loud, and, well, I'll spare you my opinion on the quality of the music. Even though I'm only 37, I'm officially old-fashioned. I don't even know the name of the other guy who sings in Van Halen. Oh, come on, that was funny. In fact, I was focused on the children to the almost exclusion of everything else. That's probably why Angela scared me so much. Hey, she said. What? I asked a little sharply. I hate to admit it when someone scares me. Why don't you talk to her? She answered. Angie, what are you talking about? I asked. That teacher over there, said Angela, pointing to a cute brunette in a cream and charcoal sweater. She's been watching you the entire evening. It'll all be over in 30 minutes, so get out while you have the chance. I looked at her, puzzled. I quietly scanned the gym and noticed the woman she was talking about. She really was a brunette, and in my opinion, she was more than just pretty. She was about 5 feet 6 inches and well tan like me. She was curvy, and the sweater couldn't hide her breasts. Her beautiful bust tapered at her waist and expanded again at her curvaceous hips in fifth place. The knee-length skirt showed off her shapely calves and just a hint of her hips whenever she took a step. I wondered if she was wearing pantyhose or stockings. Yes, she was very attractive, there was no denying that. She didn't look at me, although I wouldn't have minded if she did. After a moment, I turned and looked at Angie. Are you sure she was looking at me? I asked, my disbelief evident in my tone. I'm sure, Angela said, smiling widely. Believe me, Buster, a woman always notices such things. Go ahead, take a chance. Dawn, at least you'll probably have some fun for the night. 
But who knows? Maybe there is something more. I shrugged. Why the hell not? I had nothing in common with anyone, and she was truly a sweetheart. Physically, she was almost the exact opposite of Brittany. After a moment, I decided to go for it. As if to spur me on, Angela slapped me on the shoulder so that no one else could see. I'm coming, I'm coming, I told her very quietly. I smoothly made my way through the crowd of jumping children to where the pretty woman stood. As I got closer, I could tell that while she was by no means old, she was older than I had first thought. I guessed she was about the same age as me. She certainly couldn't be older than me. When she turned to me, I also saw that her eyes were a strikingly bright shade of green. I'd never seen eyes that shade of green before and wondered if they were her natural color or if she was wearing some kind of contact lens. Hey, I said, closing the last few feet of distance between us. I'm Don Summers, Danielle and Brian's father. She smiled at me and extended her hand. Hi, Don. I'm Greg's mom, and I also teach sixth grade here, she said as we shook hands. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, I said, smiling. Also, she said, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but it's quite unusual to see a single man as an escort at one of these. I'm sure, I said, shrugging. My kids are worth it. Besides, I don't have anything else going on. I stopped, curious. How did you know I was single? I asked. Well, for example, your ring finger is empty, and that woman you were hanging out with all night is here with her husband, she shrugged and continued. I'm a decent observer when it comes to people, and you seem unattached. You are very good, I said. Yes, I am actually unattached at the moment. She smiled at me, and only then did I realize that I was still holding her hand. Oh, sorry, I mumbled awkwardly, letting go of her. No need, she said, laughing once again with her delicious laugh. If I were against it, I would have let you know. Her smile, as I noted earlier, was very pleasant. It lit up her face like a beacon and completely captivated me. Her eyes, be it the striking green color or some other aspect, were mesmerizing. They pulled me in, not only could I not look away, but I had no desire to. After a few minutes, I finally managed to speak again. Honestly, I haven't felt such a strong interest in a woman since Mandy. We showed each other pictures of our children and talked a little about each of them. I told her that Danielle had already talked about becoming a nurse and that Brian was having so much fun helping me with my work. Don told me about Greg's love for all things electronic and also about some of the little troubles that love had gotten him into. Apparently, he thought he was some kind of hacker. I was so busy talking to Don that Angela attacked me a second time. Damn it, time to gather the kids, Don, she said, smirking at my confusion. The DJ is already packing up. With the other adults, we began preparing the children for departure. After making sure the right child was with the right parent, we cleaned up and left. All of our children were starting to recover from their sugar high, and it seemed like I might actually get some peace and quiet once I got home. As we were leaving, Don sidled up to me. I was a little surprised when she took my arm as we walked from the school gym to the parking lot. Call me some evening when you have time, she said, slipping a folded piece of paper into my shirt pocket. I'd like to have dinner with you sometime. Then she and her son walked to their car, and she disappeared. This night was a new beginning for me. As you can imagine, I didn't have to wait long to call Dawn. I couldn't get her out of my head, she was absolutely adorable. Our first dinner date didn't end in the bedroom but did include some very nice kissing. She seemed to be as into me as I was into her, but that didn't necessarily mean she was ready to throw caution to the wind. I shouldn't have been any more ready for this than she was, but if given the opportunity, I would have taken her to bed in a heartbeat. However, I am not the type to insist on this, so we went at her pace. Dawn was a fascinating woman in many ways. She was very smart but also very practical. Like me, she didn't have a lot of money, so she came up with a lot of simple hacks to save money. She freely shared them with me, helping me free up the always necessary funds for other things. In turn, I learned that she was a frustrated gardener. She loved growing plants, especially flowering trees and vines. Unfortunately, she was cursed with a brown thumb. Luckily, 
I knew plenty of ways to bring diseased plants back to beautiful life and was absolutely thrilled to share them. I was also able to help her, with just a few inexpensive tools, transform her backyard and patio into almost an outdoor living room. The night between us, when we finally took that step, was wonderful. Her body was soft and seductive, her skin silky and smooth, and the aroma was incredible. The connection I felt with her was very deep. Over time, I introduced her to some new things in the bedroom, nothing wild, just a few new positions. We became closer and closer to each other, both emotionally and physically. Of course, I told her about Brittany and then about Mandy. To say she was stunned would be a gross understatement. Unlike other women I told this story to, she wasn't particularly bothered by my posting the video online. Her opinion was the same as mine, actions have consequences. All things considered, she actually got off pretty lightly. Dawn was good with my kids, and I have to admit, her son Greg was a good kid. The kids seemed to get along well with each other too. Greg was only a couple of months younger than Danielle, and they were in the same class. Yes, Dawn was doing very well, so well that when our relationship reached the eight-month mark, I was thinking about marriage again. Thoughts of Mandy's disaster didn't slow me down for a second. I didn't let the past ruin my future. Of course, I knew there was a chance she would refuse, and I was willing to accept that. But I didn't think she would. Although I talked about it with my children, Danielle was delighted with this. Brian was less so but agreed that everything would be fine. Personally, I think he still harbored thoughts about me dating Brit again. I finally bought another engagement ring. Now all I had to do was decide how to ask her. After thinking about it, I decided to do it at my 40th birthday party in just two weeks. It wasn't supposed to be a huge event, but my closest friends, my parents, and Don and Greg would be there. Yes, I thought that would be ideal. The only real challenges during this two-week wait were getting the kids to keep a secret from both Don and Greg, getting a secret invitation from Don's parents and her brother, and not accidentally doing something on my own to give it away. Finally, the evening of my birthday arrived. In fact, my birthday was the day before, but for obvious reasons, I waited until Friday evening to celebrate. My parents rented a party room at a local restaurant, Misha, which specialized in ethnic Russian cuisine. It was a nice place that didn't break the bank and was also kid-friendly, which was a big plus. Dinner was excellent, and I really enjoyed it. We had a lot of fun eating and dancing. Finally, it was time for gifts. I opened them and thanked all the people who gave them to me. Despite all this, I tried my best not to give away my plans. Don was a little surprised to see her parents and older brother at the party but took it in stride. As I finished unwrapping my last gift, I realized I had achieved my surprise. I put the last gift on the table and stood up, putting my arm around Dawn and holding her gently. She bowed her head toward me, and I smiled at everyone. Thank you all so much for coming tonight, I said cheerfully. You all made this the best 40th birthday party I've ever thrown. There was polite laughter at my joke, and I heard one of the children complain that he didn't understand it. The subsequent laughter provided an excellent cover for Angela as she snuck up behind me, quietly placed the ring box in my free hand, and just as quietly slipped away. There's one last thing before we all head out, I said. I received many gifts this evening, but I hope to receive one more. Actually, I hope Dawn gives me a real gift. Dawn tilted her head towards me with a confused look on her face. I returned her gaze lovingly, meeting her eyes and grinning. Dawn, I love you so much, I said. You've made my life complete. The only thing that could make it better is if you gave me you for the rest of my life. I got down on one knee and handed her the open ring box, without taking my eyes off her. Dawn, my love, will you marry me? There was a deathly silence in the private dining room as everyone, including the children, finally realized what was happening. I eagerly looked into the eyes of my beloved, expecting to hear her joyful cries of yes, yes. I waited and waited some more. Dawn? I finally said, honey, please say something. I, ah, uh, she muttered, looking away from me and wildly scanning the faces in the room. Dawn, now is not a good time to, ah, uh, talk about, maybe we should, Dawn stumbled over her words and backed away from me. I sighed and stood up again, with my heart slowly breaking. I watched as Dawn hurried over to Greg, 
took his hand, and hurried out of the restaurant, not even stopping to put on her coat. A few seconds after her hasty departure, I turned around and saw almost everyone looking at me in shock. Well, I said, anyway, thank you everyone for coming and making this such a wonderful evening. Have a good night, everyone. I gave a big fake smile and gathered my things. After putting on my coat, I stared at the ring box on the table. I was sorely tempted to just throw it away like I did last time, but I didn't. I might as well make sure I get my money back. I put the damn thing in my coat pocket and pointed at the kids. Don, honey, my mother said lightly, grabbing my hand, do you want us to take the kids tonight? I shrugged. I didn't care. Do you guys want to spend the night with Grandma and Peepee? Yes, that would be cool, Brian exclaimed. Dad, Danielle began, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Danny, but you don't have to say anything, I said firmly, suppressing anything she might say. I wasn't ready to hear something like that yet, and luckily she noticed. Just remember, I love you, Daddy, she said softly. She hugged me tightly, her small arms squeezing me as tightly as they could. She then gathered her things and followed her grandmother to their car. My dad paused for a moment. So, let's hit three. Strike three, son, I said. Yep, strike three, he answered as if nothing had happened. Luckily, life gives you more than just one move. There will be others in the future. Well, at least I proved I can still pick good ones, I said with a bitterly sarcastic smile. Dad shrugged and sighed. Well, son, life gets to us all at some point, he said. You are not alone in this. I hate to tell you this, but all you can do is try to ignore it and move on. You continue to relieve stress as you see fit. Your mother and I will take care of the children, and if you need to talk, you know we're always here for you. I grabbed my things and left while Angela and Mike paid the bill. I could tell Angie wanted to talk to me, but luckily Mike stopped her. I know she just wanted to be a friend to me, but the last thing I wanted right now was a friend. The journey home was fortunately short. As soon as I entered the house, I double-locked the door, threw my things on the couch, and began a serious binge. It didn't last as long as I wanted, I didn't have any solid items at home, and my beer supply wasn't up to the task. I thought about going to the liquor store down the street but quickly discarded that idea. Getting drunk would be nice, but I didn't need a hangover tomorrow. Instead, I sat in my chair and watched 80s sitcoms on Netflix. After a few hours, I felt sleepy. The next morning, I woke up with a desperate need to go to the toilet and a terrible ache in my back from sleeping in that chair. I need to remember not to do this in the future, I thought as I went about my morning routine and took a shower. After drying off, I put on clean clothes and went in search of breakfast and some aspirin. As I cooked the eggs, I tried my best not to think about Dawn. It hurt much worse than my head. Something went wrong. I was so sure that she felt the same way as me. Of course, my traitorous mind flashed back to the fact that I felt exactly the same way when I proposed to Mandy. Stupid mind. I decided then and there that I was done with the concept of marriage. From that moment on, buddies became the way to the future. I finished breakfast and cleaned up. I then spent some time in the basement using the weight bench. Pure physical exertion was exactly what I needed to release my stress and anger. After that, I took another shower. While drying myself, I remembered that I still hadn't turned on my mobile phone after last night. I turned it on and, sure enough, my voicemail box was full. There were also a bunch of texts. I looked through the messages first and found that they were all from friends, expressing sympathy and offering to talk. The voicemails were almost the same, except for one from Dawn. It only lasted a couple of seconds and simply said, I'm sorry, my love. Please believe that I have my reasons. I hope you will someday understand and forgive me. Goodbye. I didn't answer any messages or calls. I spent the rest of the day watching TV until my parents brought the kids home in the evening. It's been 10 years since my divorce from Brittany. Danielle is in college studying nursing, and Brian just graduated from high school and will be going to college in the fall. He plans to become a business major. Will you want to join the family business? Time will tell. I'm 45 years old and still single. 
I have occasional encounters for pleasure in the bedroom, but there is no one I would call special. A year ago, Mandy reappeared in my life, well, sort of. She just wanted to have a good time, and this time she made it clear right away. We had fun together on a regular basis for about two months, and then she left without any hard feelings. She asked me why I never got married, and I answered the truth, it was no longer worth the risk. I would like to have a wife. I would like to wake up next to the same face every morning and know that she is mine, to know that she will be with me for the rest of my life. But some stories don't have happy endings, and for now, it looks like mine will be one of them. Don's parents told me that she moved out about a year after I proposed to her. Before you ask, no, I didn't look for this information. They came to me, hoping that I could persuade her to come back. I thought it was crazy, considering that the thought of being with me was probably what made her leave. I don't know this for sure, Don never bothered to explain her reasons, and I just don't care. To hell with her. Brittany, on the other hand, did get married. She and my son Brian spent several years trying to forge some sort of reconciliation between us, but it never happened. I don't believe people change. Brittany was a cheater, and no amount of regret, sadness, or therapy would change that. Eventually, they gave in, and she married the owner of the cafe where she worked. The children say they are happy. Good for them. I hope she signed the marriage contract for his sake. She's still a very, very attractive woman. My father died a few months ago, leaving me the business. Unfortunately, I don't think my mother will live long. She worries too much. The pain of losing her husband is visible in her every look, in every word she utters, and in every movement. The kind of loving, committed marriage they shared is something I have always wanted for myself, but perhaps such a thing no longer exists in our modern world. I don't know. I'm a gardener, and I'll leave philosophy to the experts. Before leaving for the second time, Mandy asked me an interesting question. Do you have any regrets? She said. Yes, of course. I regret that I married a cheater. I regret wasting my time with Mandy and Don, thinking they could be potential life partners. I regret that I can't meet anyone with the same values and desires as me. But then I realized that Mandy really wanted to know. She really wanted to know if I regretted making Britney a famous adult film buff. She wanted to know if I regretted divorcing her as quickly as possible and hating her for years afterward. The truthful answer is no. I regret that publishing the video was necessary, but I don't regret doing it and never will. She deserved it. If I could go back, I would do everything the same. Maybe I saved a little trouble for a new husband. If so, then at least something good came out of it. As for me, I will continue to work, love my children, and watch them grow up. I'm looking forward to meeting my grandchildren. I will never completely stop looking for a wife. As I said before, you have to look to find, but now it's not my priority. I will enjoy whatever happiness I can find when and where I find it. It's not the life I would have chosen, but it's not bad. And yes, in my free moments at work, I still sometimes enjoy watching the birds. What do you think of our story today? It seems to me that the wife is absolutely wrong for cheating on her husband, and he is simply brilliant because he came up with an unusual scheme to detect cheating. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the comments.